Hey everyone, I'm talking with Emmanuel from Epic Games and I had a couple of production questions and I thought I'd just jump in and ask them. So first and foremost, what do you use prototypes for when you are making a game, generally speaking? Uh, you, uh, tools? Ooh. Specifically, are you asking about? No, no, just uh, just what, what are you prototyping when it comes to the gameplay? Ah, um, so it, it, it's usually that. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're prototyping, it's to figure out you know, the type of game you want to make. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you want to play around with, you know, the genre or the gameplay style. Or maybe you don't even know what the gameplay style should be. Should it be third person or first person game? You might do a prototype of both okay. um, with, you know, enough gameplay that you can have some of the fun. And then play it both ways and see, you know, if, if one feels better than the other. So prototype prototyping is usually the, the the time where you want to play around with ideas or even just find an idea. Gotcha. Um, you know, companies I've been at, we've used game jams to kind of figure out the type of thing we want to do. Gotcha. Um, you know, one of the games I worked on, uh, it it was essentially fallout from a game jam. It was something the game jam was so fun, it was turned into a game. Gotcha, gotcha. And how many uh, uh, you know prototypes do you make throughout development? So let's say you're working on the game, you've yeah. got an idea mm -hmm. of what you want to do. Are you constantly pushing out prototypes to see, okay, maybe are we getting this right or is there a different perspective on this? Do you mix that pre-production and production stage of things? Mm -hmm. Definitely, and it, it varies studio by studio as well. So, you know, one of the studios I worked at was very player centric and wanted to find the fun. And so, technically, every feature we worked on started as a prototype. And the gotcha. goal was to check it in in a playable state as fast as possible, even if it wasn't polished, just to be able to play around with it. And sometimes the feature kind of falls flat, it's not fun. Sometimes the feature is fun ish. But then you find some weird offshoot where, well, this feature itself isn't fun, but it's causing this other thing to potentially happen in the game world. Maybe let's go down that route and then solidify that as a feature. Gotcha. Um, that's definitely happened with some weapons in games I've worked on. I'm avoiding naming names just because a lot of mm. companies are run by lawyers. And they're people. <laughs> so I'm going to be very generic. Um, but yeah, so prototyping is always a good thing. At the end of the day, though, you have to balance it against your time, right? If you're time constrained, because yeah. at the end of the day, time and money kind of rule it. Um, you know, if, if you have the time to do it, definitely prototype, get something checked in, let the other the rest of the team, let the public mess around with it, give you ideas. Um, there are people who will always find new ways to use a tool you give them in ways you didn't expect. Yeah. And sometimes that's enough to give you the kind of creative spark to like, finish it or go a different way or go three different ways, right? It's, you know, it, it, no one person has the best ideas, right? You end up wanting to, you know, make a thing or make multiple things, but then see how people react to it, see how people use it. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, throughout the process, uh, if, if you have the time and you can afford it, make a bunch of prototypes, mm -hmm. test you know the things to see if they're fun before you bring them in but it sounds like time pressure is one of those things that's going to push you to production with what you have as soon as possible where have you seen that go wrong um so in the past there have been times where we did that type of thing too close to shipping a project and there's a minimum amount of time that you really need to like harden a feature right yeah and so you know, sometimes if it comes online, if you start trying to do that thing too late, you're taking resources away potentially from hardening the rest of the game. So the rest of the game might not come together like you wish because yep. you're on this other thing. That thing might take more time than you expect to complete. And so now you're sinking even more time into this thing that you now really want, but the rest of the game is kind of suffering. And from gotcha. a production standpoint, one of the one of the things producers do that are so, that's so valuable is they're ideally tracking this kind of give and take. Yep. And so if you're going down this route, it's like, you know what, this feature, even though it's late in the game, pun intended, um, we want to really do this. This is really going to make our game better. Yep. But we're going to need to figure out something else to like either release in an OK enough state or maybe cut and patch in later. Yep. And production can keep an eye on the whole process to kind of figure out 
you know, the minimum potential amount of stuff that would have to move to get this thing in at the end. Really quick, um, one of the questions that comes to my mind is, you know, there's always this this fight between code quality almost and, uh, you know, getting there. And where, where have you found that fight? Where, where do you find your companies having the greatest success? If, if they're pushing toward one side or the other, give us a little experience with that one. Yeah, so I'm, my background is generalist, but I, I, I really love and enjoy performance. So, you know, obviously at the end of the day, if all code is written as performant as possible, like it makes me happy, but I know it's not possible. Yeah. And so usually the way it works is earlier in the project, you have the ability to check in stuff that might not be as polished because you can come back to it later. But it's called tech debt, right? It's like, yeah. I now have the system in, it needs a bunch of work. And unless you're really strict on production to make sure engineers have time to come back to tech debt that you're checking in, you will ship the tech debt. Yeah. And so my, you know, my personal preference, like when I'm a lead, what I push for is stuff can be checked in that's not finished, but it can't be so slow that it affects people's workflow. Gotcha. Um, so if you create like a new weapon, but whenever somebody shoots it, you drop down to three FPS for <laughs> eight seconds, right? Yeah. That is unplayable that should not be checked in it, there should be at least a minimum quality bar. uh and then make a note that you need to come back to this thing later um when it comes to you know general performance and quality as the project goes along as you profile your game you'll figure out where to optimize because at the end of the day you have goals yeah and your goals are you know let's say it's a 60 fps game or 30 fps game once you're hitting your target on your target hardware you don't need to spend time optimizing even yeah. and the vast majority of your code doesn't run like every frame or run a lot. So use tools to figure out the code that you really need to get the quality for. And in terms of uh, just code quality in general, you always want to make sure your code is written in a way that you can come back to it in a year, remember what you did and fix it, or someone else can come back in a year and remember uh, and read the code, understand it and fix it. Yeah. So you want to always make sure that your code is at least well commented or if for some reason you have to do some really gnarly hack uh, to get you know the performance you need out of it, you comment the heck out of it yeah. um, so that people can come back to it and understand it. Um, because, well, everybody writes bugs and usually code like that tends to have the most bugs or the most unexpected um, side effects later on. Gotcha, gotcha. Really quick, um, I'm curious, a, a large scale company like Epic Games, you're going to have um, you know a lot of people working on a project. Um, we, we're experimenting with a little something, and we are seeing if we can turn the energy of our movement into things that we can impact. We, we, we have a vision for virtual civilization that is ethical. Mm -hmm. It's not controlled necessarily by corporations. Uh, think of us as the mm -hmm. Wikipedia of, of the future of uh, you know the metaverse, as they call it, but we call it virtual civilization. Mm -hmm. It's different. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a diff fundamentally different concept. Anyway, I don't want to go on to all that. My question has to do with team size. You know, How do you manage? I, I find that the moment you get beyond seven people, uh, you can get into real trouble. Do you manage that trouble or do you just divide people up into groups of seven people? And then how do you communicate with those people? Yeah, that, that's a very good, uh, very good question. Um, I've, I've managed teams that were close to seven. And then I've been a lead programmer on a couple of titles, which meant I was in charge of all of engineering. Yeah. But I always had sub leads to help kind of focus on individual groups, you know, graphics lead, gameplay lead, systems lead. Um, so, you know, the, the, the bigger the group is, the more management structure you need. Yeah. But the tricky bit is not getting buried in process. Gotcha. Um, and the communication is always the hardest bit. And of course, the more people you have, the harder it is to communicate. Um, I've never worked on a game where it's been perfect. Um, you know, I've, I've worked on games where it was better than the previous game. We kind of learned our people and our process and improved on it. Yep. So part of it is you're going to have to kind of feel out the team and how they like to work, how they like to communicate. Some people prefer typing like in Slack or Discord. Some people prefer face-to-face -face time. Yep. Um, you have to kind of figure out that mix and you don't want to ideally make people too uncomfortable. If someone's more of a text typer, don't force them into a lot of face-to-face -face meetings unless they're you know absolutely necessary. But, you know, find the way that communicates. So, yep. you know, whatever your management number is if you're finding seven is it then kind of do that and you can even do something like 
and there's a group of seven people and just nominate one of those people to be like the primary communicator yeah. even if you don't want to give them like a lead title they're kind of in charge of figuring out what the team is doing communicating it out and having that person kind of be the go-to potentially for questions or even maybe rotate that around yeah. a different person every week um it's it's really something you're going to have to you know figure out on your own see what works and definitely grow this process slowly you don't want to just blast across to 100 people and then figure out what works yeah. you know, start with two groups of seven figure out a way that they can communicate really well on a third group then things might start falling apart and you might have to come up with a different process um but at the end of the day if you have a shared space for documentation that people are good at updating like a wiki that's a good at least starting place gotcha. um to have you know your knowledge bank um obviously you should have some sort of like bug slash task database i prefer when the database does both things at once yeah. so i can see as as someone who does work i can see all my work i can see my bugs and my tasks the relative priority so i know what to work with. yeah um, i worked on projects where that was split and occasionally i'd ignore my bugs because i had some super high priority tasks i was working on but it turned out i had bugs that were actually higher priority than that gotcha. and so you know, make it make it easy for people to adjust the info make it easy for people to communicate and over time it will kind of organically make its way to a place where the team it works for the team you're on or it won't work and then you'll have to figure out you know the next thing to go to do and like i said i've never worked on a team where it was perfect it's all about you know baby steps communication during all of those steps as you're growing and yeah. you know seeing what works for your team awesome all right, I won't hog any more time for production. That's it for this production video. See you.